The Dogon people live in eastern Mali, east of the Niger River and just west of the border with Burkina Faso. They live on the Bandiagara cliffs or on the flat plateau below. The Dogon are farmers and grow maize, millet, sorghum, and especially onions. They are famous for their rich culture, which Western scholars have been studying for almost a century. The Dogon villages have become a very popular area for cultural or adventure tourism in the past two to three decades, and every year thousands of tourists from America, France, China, Japan, and all of Western Europe visit the villages to watch Dogon masks perform and to experience the picturesque environment of the cliffs. Archaeological evidence and the oral traditions of the Dogon and several neighboring peoples make it clear that the Dogon are not the original inhabitants of the Bandiagara cliffs. Many sources describe an earlier culture, usually called Telem, that has occupied the region for centuries. They were absorbed or driven out by the immigrant Dogon. In the 1960s and 1970s, a Dutch team of archaeologists studied the skeletal remains and tombs high in the cliffs, which were identified as Telem. Comparison with the skeletal structure of modern Dogon seems to indicate clearly that the two peoples were in fact of different origin and physically unrelated. The use of carbon-14 dating techniques on artifacts found in the burials provided dates in about the 2nd and 3rd centuries BC. Later dates from 1000 to 1500 AD were obtained for granaries built by the Telem. Marcel Griol's informants told him that the Dogon had migrated to the cliffs from the southwest Monde area in Mali, while Germain Dieterlin has identified the Telem with the modern Kurumba in northern Burkina Faso. The fact that the Dogon speak a language in the Gur or Voltaic family of languages and possess many other strong cultural similarities to Voltaic peoples indicates an origin for the Dogon in the upper basin of the White Volta River in what is now modern Burkina Faso. My own research on the art from the region, especially of the Mosi, indicates that Dogon occupied the northwest corner of, of Burkina Faso, in fact, the traditional Mosi state of Yatenga, until about 1480, when they fled to the nearby Bandiagara cliffs in the face of continuous attacks by invading Mosi cavalry, who were moving into the area from the south. Those few Dogon who remained behind in Yatenga were subjugated by the horsemen from the south and were integrated into a new, rather heterogeneous, Mosi society. The Dogon priest, or Hogan, became the Mosi Tengsoba, or earth priest. The descendants of the original Dogon inhabitants of Yatenga produced tall plank top masks and round or oval concave faces divided vertically by a dentate ridge. These Mosi masks bear a strong resemblance to certain plank masks produced by the modern Dogon.
There has been a great deal of discussion in the past two or three decades about the research among the Dogon of the famous French scholar Marcel Griol. Griol first visited the Dogon in the early 1930s when he accompanied a French expedition that traveled across West Africa from Senegal in the west to Djibouti in the east. The members of the expedition knew of the importance of the Dogon because of the earlier 1907 travels of the German explorer Leo Frobenius. Expedition members were impressed by the culture of the Dogon people and by their picturesque environment. Griol returned repeatedly to the Dogon cliffs until just before his death in 1956. He was accompanied by numerous students and colleagues, including the famous scholar Germain Dieterlin. In 1938, Griol published an important book titled Dogon Masks, in French, Masque Dogon. On one of his trips to the cliffs, he devoted 33 days to interviewing a very senior Dogon elder named Ogotemeli. en particulier, devait nous expliquer toute la technique, toute la mystique du masque. La taille de cet objet nécessite de nombreuses précautions. Il va se dérouler pendant des heures. Entre temps, le rite capital est exécuté sur la terrasse mortuaire, mortuaire les masques dansent pour expulser l'âme encore présente. Celle-ci, effrayée par tout ce déploiement d'images d'hommes et d'animaux tués, s'enfuit vers nous. Le masque dirigé, autrement dit maison à étage, vient lui aussi exécuter le salut aux morts. Il avait son mât sur les reliques représentant la dépouille. Although Griol had been trained in both Amharic and Guise, Ethiopian languages, he did not speak the Dogon language and was forced to use an interpreter. The information that Griol gathered from Ogotemeli was extremely elaborate and complex and resulted in 1948 in an important book titled Conversations with Ogotemeli. Dieu commença par tracer des signes. Les signes se sont transformés en dessins. Dessiner, c'est faire commencer à être. L'eau, l'air, le feu, la terre. Les signes du début, les signes de Dieu sont tracés en noir, couleur d'eau, sous les autels au moment de leur fondation. Au commencement, Dieu se tenait à l'intérieur de l'œuvre du monde. Il était comme un mouvement tournoyant. Une graine se déposa, minuscule, invisible, au centre. La graine éclata et la parole de Dieu s'y enroula. La graine, l'œuvre du monde, c'est aussi un placenta. Au sein de cette matière vivante, Dieu créa les premiers êtres animés, deux paires de jumeaux mâles. Et Dieu leur destinait une épouse parfaite, leur sœur jumelle. Griol's scholarship attracted the interest of numerous scholars around the world who were impressed by the sophistication of Dogon religion. It is clear that Griol made an enormous contribution to the understanding and appreciation of African philosophy. Quand il meurt, l'homme d'Ogon, attaché à de longues lianes, est hissé dans des nécropoles qui se trouvent parfois à plus de 300 mètres au-dessus de la plaine. Et aux guerriers seront dans quelques jours célébrés en l'honneur de Griol.
moment capital du rituel funéraire, l'assaut de la terrasse du défunt. En 1933, pour la première fois au monde, ce fut le professeur Griol qui photographia un assaut identique. Aujourd'hui, cette même scène se répète, mais le défunt, c'est lui. Comme le prescrit le rituel funéraire d'Ogon, un mannequin effigie représentant le défunt est dressé sur le toit du mort. Telle est la figure du professeur Griol, ressuscité par ses amis Dogon, habillé des vêtements qu'il portait durant ses séjours dans le pays. La dépouille mortelle du professeur est restée en France. Mais les Dogons veulent enterrer symboliquement leur ami dont l'âme doit reposer parmi eux. Ils ont fixé un autre mannequin représentant le cadavre. Sur... Que les plus divers peuvent se présenter sur la place publique. Femme peu, l'ornée de Cori. Over the past few decades, scholars have noticed that it is quite difficult to match the information about belief and religion that he gathered with Dogon sculpture, both masks and figures. Whenever scholars have attempted to use Dogon sculpture as illustrations of the text that Griol collected from Ogotomeli, they have run into contradictions and paradoxes. More recently, an entire generation of much younger scholars have carried out extensive research in the Dogon area and have contributed to a much clearer understanding of Dogon belief and art. The very famous French filmmaker Jean Rouche made an enormous contribution to the appreciation of Dogon life and art through a series of nine films that he produced between 1967 and 1973. Elle, Germaine Dieterlin, une sorte de inspirée. Vous non, je ne suis pas bidoniste inspiré. Je, je, suis, je suis fille d'ingénieur, mais bien sûr, j'en ai séparé. Et lui, lui, Marcel Griol, euh, à la fois ordonnateur et ordinateur, travaillant avec ses informateurs en pratiquant la maïotique socratique, et avec ses collaborateurs, pratiquant la méthode des approximations successives. Et j'ai compris à ce moment-là que c'était ça l'ethnographie, se défaire de ses propres systèmes de pensée pour mieux comprendre la pensée des autres. The Sigi ceremony is a very important event held once every 60 years in the Dogon villages. The last Sigi ceremony was held in 1967 and another is due to be held very soon. It is not held in every village and it changes venue from one village to another. It commemorates the introduction of death among the Dogon, according to the story collected by Marcel Griol. At the creation, all humans were immortal, but because of sacrileges that they committed, they were condemned to death. It also marks the transition from one Dogon generation to the next. Finally, it represents the invention or introduction of speech or the word among the Dogon people. The result is that a person who has experienced two Sigi ceremonies is both very elderly and is held in enormous respect. The Sigi ceremony is marked by the carving of a great mask, which is never worn as a mask but is used as an altar. Among the most important characters present during the Sigi ceremony is the woman who has witnessed two ceremonies separated by 60 years. She is called the Yasigine and represents all of the women who are living witnesses to the revelation of God's word. Le lendemain, chacun peut les voir. Ils sont là, tous les quatre, la tête dans le témoin de pierre de la mare, noir, blanc et rouge, symbole du serpent mort, blanc et rouge, symbole du serpent vivant. C'est devant l'ancêtre serpent, quatre fois présent, que se rassemblent les hommes du Sigi. Ici, ils portent tous la tenue décrite par Marcel Griot. 
pantalon de coton noir, baudrier de cori, haut bonnet en tête de poisson, chasse-mouche, calbasse, crosse-siège. Et un ancien dit, si Dieu n'a pas gâté la fête, rien ne gâtera le Sidi. Voir devant la caverne du Sidi. Asseyez-vous, face à l'est. D'autres se sont réfugiés à l'ombre de la caverne, près des quatre grands masques. Un ancien les chasse. Reprenez vos places, taisez-vous. Vous avez bien suivi les anciens. Salut à celui qui vous guide. Bonne journée. Kama soit votre compagnon. Eh, hey, vous les vieux, ce n'est pas votre sigui. Vous n'avez qu'à nous regarder. Remuez-vous, c'est votre jour. Du grand jusqu'au petit, c'est votre jour. Quand vos parures sont belles, vos danses sont belles, vous écoutez le tambour, je vous salue. Salut de Brousse. Les danses s'arrêtent. Mais les plus petits garçons, portés à l'épaule par les anciens, font au centre du champ de lignage le tour de l'hôtel. Quand on les rapporte à leur moment, ils ont dansé le cycle. Après huit semaines d'absence, ils reviendront dans leur maison. Based on style and composition, scholars have organized Dogon figures into several groups. One large group includes figures which have their hands raised above their heads and which are very often covered with large quantities of dried sacrificial material. Often these figures lack details in the carving, and where there are any details, they have been obscured by the accumulation of sacrificial material. These objects have been attributed to the so-called Telem people, whether or not they were in fact actually carved by anyone other than the Dogon. A second large group is usually referred to as Classic Dogon, These objects generally don't have their hands raised above their heads. Many of them have elaborate details, and they usually lack the thick layers of sacrificial material. Many of these objects are quite complex in their composition and include figures of farmers, of women who seem to be engaged in daily activities, figures of horsemen, pairs of male and female figures, musicians that include the players of stringed instruments and of balaphones, and simple standing figures with their arms at their sides. Many of these objects are quite dynamic and strongly carved. The most common characteristics include a distinctive sagittal crest of hair from the front of the head to the back of the head, ears in a distinctive capital C shape, and prominent noses that take the form of an arrowhead pointing downward with flaring nostrils. Very often the upper arms parallel the torso, and the lower arms parallel the thighs. 
There is also a smaller group of figures that seem unusually naturalistic and may be much more recent work than other figures. Figures embody spiritual power just as masks do. Figures are placed on shrines to which people can pray and make offerings, asking for the blessings of the spirits represented by the figures on the shrines. Many of these spirits are completely abstract, and so the objects that represent them are also abstract. However, some spirits have very specific roles that they play in the life of the family and the community, and so the spirits are represented by figures such as maternity figures, musicians, warriors, horsemen, and many others. Although these appear to represent humans in the village going about their daily activities, they are in fact portraits of abstract ideas. I have frequently asked acquaintances among the Voltaic peoples of Burkina Faso whether these figures represent ancestors or spirits. The answer is almost always yes. To the people in the villages there is little distinction between the spirits of ancestors and the spirits of nature. The ancestor spirits serve as intermediaries with the spiritual forces that provide their blessings over the community. There is also a large group of objects that have been beautifully carved, but which are not figurative. These include stools with a round seat and a round base, which are connected by a central post, and by four pairs of figures distributed equally around the circumference. The central post is said to represent the tree of life, the Seba Pantandra, and the four figures represent the original Nomo pairs. Many of these stools have zigzag patterns carved around the circumference of both the seat and the base. Many French scholars have interpreted these as symbols of water. This is an excellent example of misinterpretation based on pure guesswork that is unsubstantiated by field research. In fact, the pattern is universal among Voltaic peoples, including the Dogon, and it represents the path of the ancestors as they descended from heaven to earth on the Ark of the Rainbow. The same zigzag pattern often appears on masks and other art objects. There are also a large number of beautifully carved wooden bowls which are supported by figures and surmounted by a lid with the carved figure of a horseman. To the people in the villages there is little distinction between the spirits of ancestors and the spirits of nature. The ancestor spirits serve as intermediaries with the spiritual forces that provide their blessings over the community. Nomo was the first living being created by Ama, and he soon multiplied to become four pairs of twins. One of these twin Nomos rebelled against the order established by Ama. In order to purify the universe and restore order to it, Ama sacrificed another Nomo, whose body was cut up and scattered throughout the universe, just as sacrificial meat is divided and distributed at a Dogon ritual. It is easy.
Griel published this account of the Dogon discovery of masks in 1950 and makes clear how elaborate and complicated are Dogon systems of belief. It was the loan by the spirit of water to his own mother, the earth, of a fiber skirt for concealing her sex and preserving in her the moisture favorable for procreation. As the result of incest committed with her firstborn, the jackal, these fibers became red with menstrual blood, which had never appeared until then, and the earth had to lay them out to dry in the sun, on an anthill, the symbol of her sex. At this moment the jackal saw this bright stain and asked, Is it the sun, the fire, or a living thing? By heaven, replied an ant, it is not the sun nor the fire, but a living thing. Then the animal took the fibers and clothed himself in them, and when he thought his father was out of the way, he went out onto his terrace to dance in his honor. All men, says the myth, had their eyes on him. All women had their eyes on him. Barking dogs fled to their lairs. <coughs> Thus took place the first exhibition of the fiber costume which became the main accessory in the funeral dances. It was then that a woman came on the scene who belonged to the race of the little red men, the first inhabitants of Africa. She found these clothes which the jackal had, dressed herself in them, and ran back to her village, where nobody recognized her in these trappings, which caused a great panic. She made use of this instrument of terror for some time, overwhelmed, and the men seized the fibers, clothed themselves in them, and used them to honor their dead. During one of these ceremonies, the red men were surprised by a woman belonging to the race of black invaders. She was busy with her work in the bush, when she heard the beating of drums, uproar, and the throbbing of a bull roarer. Approaching, she saw strangers who danced, drank, and sang, clothed in red fibers and wearing woven hoods. One of them wore a woven mask, representing a dead elder. The black woman, astonished, threw stones at them, and hit an old man with one missile. He became impure by this contact with the outside world, and was abandoned by his companions. By his side lay a complete ritual outfit, fiber skirt, hood, and the wooden mask. Dressed in this costume, the woman returned to her village and filled her people with terror. She realized that she was in possession of an unparalleled instrument of domination, because she even frightened the men. But when they discovered her identity, they took the costume and reserved it for their own use, instructed by the old red man who had been captured and who thus became the first initiator. In those days, the Negroes did not know death. When they grew old, they went into an anthill, a symbol of the earth's sex, and there transformed themselves into a large serpent, and then into the water spirit. Then they could not use the fibers and masks for psychopompal ends. They used them entirely for aesthetic purposes, without suspecting the germ they contain, and thus they introduced death into the human world. Indeed, in spite of the instructions of the prisoner who was teaching them, the dancers had neglected to inform their chief, the oldest inhabitant, thus committing a very serious error. The old man came to the end of his days. He transformed himself into a serpent and took to the jungle track. At the same time, young masked men approached the village. On seeing this, the patriarch's wrath overflowed, and placing himself across the path, he delivered a violent harangue, which was the cause of his undoing. At a time when he was on the point of passing into a different world, when his vital force was assuming a different quality to that of human beings, he had used their language, this real establishment of contact with the world he had just left, left him impure for the time he was going to enter. 
The impurity was caused quite mechanically by the fibers worn by the young men, who had drunk his words, and in consequence a large part of the vital breath of the old man. Thus emptied of life, he could not continue his destiny, as the rites of purification did not as yet exist, and he no longer had the power to resume life in his old body. Consequently, he died on the spot, and that was how death appeared in the human world. The masks represent a variety of different spiritual characters. These are all spirits that the ancestors encountered generations ago. The young men of each family may wear masks that represent several different spirits that appeared to the ancestors and protected them from harm and to help them to find new land to farm. Some of these characters are human, including the beautiful Falani woman, the Samo warrior, or the oldest woman in the community who belongs to the mask society. The Karanjana mask represents a strange animal that Marcel Griold was never able to identify. Larger numbers of masks represent animal spirits, including the monkey, Omono, the antelope, Walu, hyenas, and crocodiles. The masks are worn by young men in the families that own them, chosen by the elders. The performers wear fiber skirts that are dyed red, and cowls of fiber that fall around their shoulders. When Marcel Griol first asked about the meaning of the Kanaga mask, he was told that it represents a bird with white wings and a black forehead. Later on, he was told that it represents a lizard with the head downward, the body vertical, and four horizontal legs. Over time, he came to understand that these were superficial meanings open to the lowest level of initiates. Its most profound meaning refers to God, Ama. As the Kanaga performer twists the top of the mask in a circle, he emulates the movement of God's hands as he formed the world. You can see how much Dogon cliff villages resemble Anasazi, or ancestral Pueblo cliff villages in the American Southwest. This is a wonderful example of two very different people, separated by vast distances of space and time, finding similar adaptations to similar environments. The internet is full of wildly imaginative stories of Dogon knowledge of a second star associated with Sirius, a star that is not visible to the human eye. Truly foolish people claim that creatures from space called Nomos actually traveled to Dogon country thousands of years ago.
For centuries, the Dogon have been farmers. They grow millet, sorghum, maize, peanuts, and especially onions. They have become major producers of onions, which they process by pounding them and drying them in the sun, 
and forming them into balls which are then shipped all over West Africa to be used for cooking. Dogon peoples conceive of their world as separated into the realm of God and the realm of humans, the spiritual world and the natural world. When they stand on the tops of the cliffs and look toward the horizon, the world seems to be an enormous circle. When they look down from the tops of the cliffs at their fields below, they see that men and women have divided the fields into squares. They then represent these two worlds with their famous baskets, which have a circular rim to represent the spirit world or the world of God, and a rectangular bottom to represent the world of humans. Inside each of the homes we see people hard at work. This woman is grinding millet between two rhinestones to use to cook dinner. In Spanish the large grindstone would be called the metate and the smaller stone that she holds in her hand would be called the mano. Une prise plus sûre. 
Here we see a man forming bricks. He uses a rectangular wooden mold, which he fills with very wet clay that has been mixed with straw. He packs the mold full of clay and then slides the mold off to leave the brick behind to dry in the sun. Again, there are Spanish words that describe these bricks as adobe. I used to be self-conscious about using a Spanish word to describe African materials until I discovered that the word adobe actually came to Spain from North Africa in the 10th century with the Moorish invasion, and it is in fact an African word. Dogon parents recognize the importance of education. This classroom has just let out for the day, and a few of the students have remained behind to do homework on the blackboard. We can see their lesson plans from the day's classes. Among the most important development projects in any village in Africa is the construction of good schools. From the late 1890s until 1960, Mali was a French colony, part of French West Africa. The result is that the language of education is French. Voici des adolescents qui font retraite chaque année dans un lieu secret à l'abri des regards indiscrets des femmes. Ils préparent des fibres qui serviront à la confection des costumes de danse. Dans un autre abri secret, à partir des fibres apprêtées, ils tresseront les cagoules, les jupes, les ceintures, les bracelets de chevilles et de bras et tous les accessoires qui composent l'équipement des masques.
Préparation des fibres, pressage, sculpture des masques dans les troncs d'arbres préparés à cet effet. Toutes ces opérations exécutées sous la direction attentive et sévère d'un maître d'initiation apprendront aux adolescents, mieux qu'un livre, les lois qui régissent le monde végétal et animal. Il faut noter que la plupart des peuples africains qui possèdent des masques sont des agriculteurs. Le maître d'initiation apprend en même temps à ses élèves les règles d'une vie morale très stricte. Le jeune danseur doit être capable de confectionner son costume et son masque de A jusqu'à Z. Chaque année, il augmentera de grade jusqu'à l'âge de 20 à 25 ans passant par tous les stades de plus en plus complexes de la société des masques avant d'être digne d'entrer dans la société des hommes. Loin du village, au bord des champs qui ont été moissonnés, la Société des Masques au grand complet est réunie maintenant pour l'initiation aux danses sacrées. The artist has carefully blocked out the mass of wood in the correct proportions and then proceeds to remove the extra wood between the large segments. By cutting with the grain, he is able to remove large portions of wood quickly. Here you see the artist inserting a bar of wood between the cheeks of the mask. The performer clamps this bar between his teeth to hold the mask rigid and upright over his face. The helmet allows the dancer, like the creator Ama, to see without being seen. Dogon man caused his own mask to wear in funerary dances and during Sigi, the renewal ceremony held every 60 years.
zigzag patterns represent the path the sacred arc of creation followed as it rocketed down the rainbow carrying the first plants, animals, and normal, normal couples. It crashed at the bottom of the rainbow and all of these creations bounced out, including the first blacksmith whose arms and legs were broken, creating joints that permitted him to pick up tools. The mask de l'aigle, dont la croix de Lorraine représente un rapace aux ailes déployées. Il est vêtu comme tous les autres de jupes, de bracelets, de fibres. Tandis que les sonneurs de trompe. <coughs> The year after a man dies and is buried, a dom is held to end the mourning and to cause the dead man's soul to depart. In April 1972, an old and great man is honored singly. Masks are carved and relatives provide food and drink in proportion to the number of damas celebrated by the old man. Pas de fête, pas de funérailles, pas de rencontre entre frères sans libation. Les danseurs étanchent leur soif en buvant de la bière de mille, le dolo. Là, c'est la place de circoncision, ici. Ouais. Là, c'est la place de circoncision et le forgeron doit s'asseoir ici. Mm -hmm. Vous voyez toutes ces traces que vous voyez sur le sur les, sur les, sur les de sang ouais, ouais. des enfants. Et je vous dis le, 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 le couteau traditionnel qui est là-bas. Mm -hmm. là mm -hmm. Il y a à peu près des centaines d'enfants qui sont circoncis dans la même journée. Mm -hmm. Après la circoncision, les enfants, avant de s'habiller, ils refont. Il y a la famille qui s'occupe de la peinture, qui viennent 
refaire les peintures ouais. avec le même image qui était là ouais. et, et ces, ces, photos, ces images c'est la couleur de la couverture de nos ancêtres que je vous ai expliqué et chaque dessin signifie des paroles tradi dans, dans les traditions d'Ogon. Dogon cliffs have been a very popular tourist spot in Africa for decades. The landscape is spectacular and the, vill and the villages are picturesque. There is air-conditioned bus service from the capital city, Bamako, along the Niger River. There are rest houses in the larger towns near the Dogon villages. Visitors can watch Dogon Mass perform and can hike through the cliffs. More serious adventurers can hike long distances along the clifftops to visit more remote towns and to see more spectacular views. In the second decade of the 21st century, serious problems were caused by the presence of Al-Qaeda in the Sahel, who kidnapped hostages and held them for ransom and committed a great deal of violence not far to the north of the Dogon Cliffs. This has had a serious impact on the income from tourism. The numbers of people visiting the cliffs increased substantially in the 1970s to the 1990s with the establishment of tourist agencies that arranged for flights and for charter buses for the trip from Bamako to Bandiagara. There were additional increases with the advent of violence in Ivory Coast because of secular conflict. Tourists who had earlier traveled to Ivory Coast began to travel to Mali. The presence of tourists has a profound effect on the economy of the Dogon Cliffs. Decades ago, all of the performances were controlled by the senior men of the community, and any income went to them. Much more recently, the performances have been organized by Muslim entrepreneurs and by the young performers themselves, and the substantial income from tourism goes to younger men with families. Many of them use this income to pay for schooling for their children and for development projects which benefit themselves and their communities. At the same time, the presence of large numbers of tourists have resulted in large quantities of new art being carved to sell to tourists. Of course, this is very helpful to the economy. To a lesser extent, sacred objects have been sold either to tourists or to art dealers and have then been sent to Paris and New York. This latter problem is rather rare because so many of the truly important sacred objects left Dogon country decades ago. What is perhaps more insidious is the shift of mass performances and art in general from the ancient ways of doing things to much more contemporary commercial goals. I've okay. bought so much art since I've been here in Africa that I can't, I just, I can't buy anymore. Yeah. I have too much. I got to figure out how to get it back to America now. Okay. So, what about this necklace? Uh, kind of I have, I bought so much. So much? Yes. The pale fox helps the Dogon people speak to God. Volpes Palida is a small, shy, furtive, creature that only appears at night. For that reason, Dogon people consider it a symbol of darkness at nighttime. The Dogon diviner smooths an area of sand on the plateau above the cliffs. He carefully marks the space with pebbles, small sticks, and tiny mounds of sand. He leaves a little bit of bait to attract the fox and at sundown returns to his village. The next morning he reads the tracks of the pale fox in the sand. These tracks tell him of the relationship between the spirits and his community. They help him tell the future.
Et si quelqu'un devient un grave malade ou soit quelqu'un, on pose la question vers euh, euh, 4 heures ou 5 heures. Et le matin de bonne heure, on sera aux tables de Renard pour voir la position qu'on avait posée hier. Et on va bien regarder. Et le Renard, il va bien parler ce soir. Ce matin, si on sera là-bas, on va bien regarder ce qu'il a parlé. Si la maladie qu'on qu doit soigner ou quelque part, on va le dire de partir là-bas. Aller là-bas et les gens de, de, de ce, ce village, il va les donner euh, des médicaments, quelque chose comme ça. Si tu ne connais pas les personnes qui ont volé ton chose, tu peux, tu peux aller au renard. C'est entre ces villages ou ces villages. Il va dire dans le village de ici. Tu vas poser encore dans cette quartier ou dans cette quartier. Il va le dire dans cette quartier. Alors tu vas choisir encore une famille. Il règle minutieusement les rapports des vivants et des morts. Le cadavre, enveloppé dans la couverture des morts, dont les rayures rappellent les chants carrelés, signe de fertilité, salués par les chants des pleureuses, sont tissés jusqu'au cimetière dans la falaise. Ainsi, la souillure de la mort est éloignée du village. Couverture des morts, couverture dont les dessins rappellent les champs carrelés, signe de germination et de résurrection. Et salué par les cris lointains des pleureuses, le corps du noyé d'Irelie monte lentement dans le ciel. These women are returning to their homes from the cemetery after burying the deceased. Any funeral in West Africa is accompanied by copious amounts of millet beer. It is quite delicious and quite safe for visitors to drink unless it has been watered down with unboiled water. It is made from sprouted millet, yeast, but no hops. Funerals are held every year in the months of May and June. This is the end of the dry season and the beginning of the rainy season. 
Once the rains have begun, farmers are too busy in the fields to take a time out for these memorial services, which are called Dhamma. Over the course of the next few years, several Dhamma will be held for each deceased elder. When the time for funerals has arrived, the elders go to the shelter, called Toguna, to organize each memorial service. Lots of millet must be gathered and beer prepared before the Dhamma can be organized. Dogon masks appear most frequently at funerals. There is a difference between funerals and memorial services. When a person dies, the remains must be buried very quickly or things get very unpleasant. If the person died quite young, the family mourns and that is the end of it. If the person died in old age, then a memorial service, which the Dogon called Dhamma, must be carefully planned and held sometime after the burial. The length of time between the burial and the Dhamma can vary depending on circumstances of time of year, weather, and other activities. Funerals are never held during the farming season when it is raining because farmers are much too busy working in their fields to take time for a large and lengthy memorial service. Some Dhamma may be held within a few weeks of burial, some are held as much as a year after burial. Smaller celebrations may be held on the anniversary of the death for years after the elder has passed away. The Dhamma celebration is the final leave-taking or separation of the spirit of the deceased from the world of the living. Elaborate offerings and prayers are made, mock battles are staged in front of the elder's home, and tools and weapons of the deceased are destroyed to break the link that ties their spirit to the village. If the person who died was male, his weapons and farming tools are broken. If the person was a woman, her cooking equipment is destroyed. At a woman's funeral, large numbers of broken gourds are displayed by the women of the family. Masks appear to honor the deceased, to reenact the historical encounters between the ancestors and the spiritual beings that watch over the lineage and the community. If the person who passed away was elderly, then he or she has had many descendants in whose lives his spirit will intervene. The more elderly the deceased was, the larger the number of masks that perform. As you watch these mask performances, you will be able to see how the masks reenact the history of these encounters, like characters in a history play. In some cases, the story is quite clear. You can see the ancient hunters and warriors acting out their battles. In other cases, where the spirits are much more abstract, such as the Kanaga, the stories are also much more abstract and difficult to recognize. The masks are controlled by the Awa society. Members of the society may carry the great mask from the cavern where it is hidden away and bring it to the memorial service where it briefly embodies the spirit of the deceased elder. The great mask reminds the Dogon of the story of the first death, which was so beautifully recorded by Marcel Griol and published in several of his books.
each Dogon family may own several masks representing different characters. Each of these characters appears in the stories told by the family of encounters between their ancestors and the supernatural spirits of the wilderness outside the village. Most frequently, the supernatural spirits saved an ancestor from harm or protected the members of the family from some sort of disaster. During the performances, the masks reenact these ancient histories and their performances act out the roles of the ancestors and of the spirits. This is identical to the performances of masks elsewhere in the Voltaic world, including the Bois and Gurunsi people and the Mosi people of Burkina Faso. violente du cou, les Kanagas touchent la terre de la pointe de leur masque, comme Dieu laissant tomber ses mains lorsqu'il fut fatigué d'avoir créé le monde.
pour tirer le fusil. Pim, pam, pim, pam, pim, pam, pim, pam, pim. Encore les femmes commencent à pleurer. Et on descend. Ça c'est matin, on monte sur les terrasse. Après on descend. Et après on descend. Tout le monde va manger et boire la bière qu'il y en a. Maintenant, on attend jusqu'à après midi, une heure. On va à la place publique pour danser avec les fusils et pour les masques de danse. On va faire ça. D'abord, on va danser avec les fusils. Après, on va danser des masques, de tout masque. Alors, après les masques, tout le monde encore va à la maison. Le deuxième jour, dans la nuit, ça c'est pour les femmes. Pour les femmes, on fait d'abord tirer le fusil dans la nuit. Si, si 
si on est fini de tirer le fusil dans la nuit, alors on commence à danser. Encore, les jeunes garçons et les, les vieux hommes et les vieilles femmes, on commence à danser tous ensemble, on va danser, même les enfants. On peut bien danser en, tous ensemble. Après la danse, et les, les jeunes garçons ils vont partir dans leur maison. Les vieux, ils viennent, les vieux euh, qui viennent avec leur tam-tam et ils dansent très doucement, très doucement. Toute la nuit, ils vont chanter, 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 chanter. Ils vont pleurer de leur douleur. Il est quitté à Dieu, il est parti à Dieu. Donc ça, c'est un problème de tout le monde. C'est normal. On, ça, on, là où on est, on est toujours avec la mort. Ils vont toute santé avec euh, leurs chansons toute la nuit. Vers euh, 11 h midi, on va danser avec le fusil. On va parler beaucoup de choses, danser et faire tout. tout The research and publications of Marcel Griol misleads people into thinking that Dogon culture is homogeneous. In fact, every Dogon village does things slightly differently. There is considerable variation in carving styles from one village to another, and the ways celebrations are carried out vary considerably. Like any other people in Africa, or for that matter anywhere else in the world, the Dogon are heterogeneous, not homogeneous. These masks are a good example of the differences between Dogon villages. Although the compositions of the masks are similar to those of other Dogon masks, the painted patterns are very different indeed. In fact, were such masks to be offered for sale in an art gallery in Paris or New York, they would be dismissed as fake on the grounds that the painted patterns are so unusual. Obviously, based on this video, they are anything but fake. Scholars, collectors, and dealers of African art have become so rigidly accustomed to the accepted canon of African art that they often make the error of rejecting as fakes or tourist art objects that are simply unusual or different. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 